Well, welcome back. Um, this is the second in a series of MBE videos recorded with the uh, uh, February 2016 bar exam in mind. Uh, the topic that we're going to cover now is going to be uh, subject matter jurisdiction. Uh, let me start off with the basics of diversity. Okay, I'll just briefly note, the scope of diversity jurisdiction under the Constitution is uh, much broader than it is under the diversity statute. The Constitution only requires minimal diversity, at least one P, diverse from any one opposing the E, and requires no amount of controversy. But what I would suspect you're much more likely to be tested on is the diversity statute, section 1332A, right? Which requires complete diversity and a mountain controversy that exceeds uh, $75,000. Well, let's talk briefly about um, each of these. First of all, let's talk about what does it mean to be a citizen of a state. A citizen of a state, for purposes of the statute, refers to a U.S. citizen who is domiciled in the state. That's very important. So, for example, say I'm Johnny Depp, I'm born in South Florida, I'm a U.S. citizen by natural birthright, and then I move to France for the rest of my life. I am not a citizen of a state. I am stateless. In other words, I'm a U.S. citizen who's domiciled abroad. Such a person cannot sue or be sued under the diversity statute, because they are neither a citizen of a state nor are they a foreigner. Similarly, if I'm domiciled in a state but I'm not a U.S. citizen, I, again, am not a citizen of a state. So say I'm, um, I'm a Daniel Craig who stars in the James Bond films, okay? I'm a British subject. Say I move to the United States, to Florida, and I become domiciled in the state of Florida. Well, then I'm a foreign citizen domiciled in the state. I am not a citizen of a state. When we break this further, to be a citizen of a state, you've got to be a U.S. citizen domiciled in the state. But domiciled in the state means reside in the state with the requisite intent. Okay? So to be a citizen of a state, you have to be a U.S. citizen who's domiciled in the state. To be domiciled in the state means you reside in the state. That means you set up a residence. You have some place to live and you've actually gone there. And you have the intent to stay. The majority test is the intent to stay indefinitely. So for example, I was born in Pennsylvania. I lived there my whole life. About 10, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I moved down here, whatever the year was and took my position as a professor of this school. I live here, I work here, my family's here, my daughters go to school here, and so on. This is the place I reside with the intent to stay indefinitely. Definitely doesn't mean forever, it just means I have no definite plans on leaving any particular time soon, okay? For instance, if I moved here for a one-year job with the plans of returning to Pennsylvania after a year, then I would reside here for a definite period of time. And under that test, I would not be domiciled in Florida. Okay? But if I move here with the intent of staying here open-endedly, now I have residence in Florida with the intent to stay here indefinitely. So me, born in Pennsylvania, U.S. citizen, currently reside in Florida with the intent to stay there indefinitely, I am a citizen of the state of Florida. Okay? That's how you measure citizen of a state. Now, there's some complexities with the statute, which I'll get to in a minute, but let's, for a moment, get to the other test, another main basis, other uh, main element, rather, which is um, the amount of controversy. Under the statute, the amount of controversy must exceed $75,000, not counting interest or costs. Okay? That means if the amount of controversy is $75,000 even, it's not met. It's got to be more. If it's $75,000, including accrued interest, it's not met. It's got to be more than $75K, not counting interest or costs. Well, how do you compute it? Well, we accept the amount pleaded by the plaintiff if made in good faith, unless we're certain that the amount of controversy can't exceed $75,000. So in your typical tort action, right, somebody's hurt, they've had some medical bills, they have pain and suffering, we don't know how much it's worth. Say they demand a million dollars, okay? Well, we don't have to be sure it's going to be over a million dollars. Instead, we think, has the plaintiff pleaded in good faith? And are we certain the plaintiff can't get over $75,000, right? So say the hospital bills are $50,000, then there's pain and suffering and loss of employment prospects, right? Do we know how much that's worth? No. 
Are we certain that it's not over $75,000? No. In that case, the amount of controversy is met because the plaintiff has pleaded in good faith and we're not certain he can't be above the jurisdictional amount. Okay, so keep the two main requirements in mind. Complete diversity and the amount of controversy. Now, complete diversity, of course, means that all plaintiffs must be diverse from all defendants. So, for instance, if you have a citizen of Florida sue a citizen of Pennsylvania and a citizen of Florida, you will not have complete diversity. On the other hand, if the citizen of Florida sues as a citizen of Pennsylvania and a citizen of New York, then there's complete diversity. Now, let's briefly look into the statute and talk about some of the complexities. Section 1332A1 means you have citizens of one state on one side, or you have citizens from a state on one side and citizens from different states on the other side. Section 1332B is when you have alienage jurisdiction. It's a citizen of a state versus foreign citizens. So, for example, say Johnny Depp wants to sue. No, Johnny Depp, bad example because he's not a citizen of the state. Say we have a Miley Cyrus wants to sue Daniel Craig for breach of contract. Okay? A Miley Cyrus is, I'm assuming, a citizen of the state, probably California, right? Be my best guess. Daniel Craig is a British subject, all right? Under 1332A2, that would be okay, because you have a citizen of the state, that's Miley, versus a citizen of a foreign state, that's Daniel Craig. That's fine. That's permitted under the Constitution and the statute. Now, you have this odd language, this exception, that comes in after the comma. What that means is, what if Daniel Craig really wants to become a U.S. citizen, right? And he moves to the United States and gets his green card, right? In other words, he becomes a lawful permanent resident of the United States. So now you have Miley Cyrus versus Daniel Craig, right? A British subject who's got his green card living in the United States. Well, is Craig a citizen of a state? And the answer is no. Because having a green card doesn't yet make him a U.S. citizen, does it? He's still a foreigner. So instead, we have a foreigner and a citizen of a state. Except that Craig is now a lawful permanent resident of the United States. Does that divest the alienage jurisdiction? And the question is, we need to know more facts. Where does Craig live in the United States? Say, for example, he sets up his domicile in California. Well, look what that does here now. Craig is now domiciled in the same state as the opposing party, right? You have Miley Cyrus, citizen of California, versus Daniel Craig, a foreigner, who's a lawful permanent resident, also domiciled in California. This language here would divest jurisdiction. This is a nice, testable question. If the bar examiners really want to, like, get your knowledge of the alienage statute, that's a good one. Now, what if Daniel Craig gets his green card, but he lives in another state, right? Then there's no problem, because first, citizen of a state, Miley Cyrus, citizen of a foreign state, Daniel Craig, but we won't have jurisdiction in the action between citizen of the state, Miley Cyrus, and the citizens of a foreign state, Daniel Craig, who are lawfully admitted for permanent residence in the U.S., Craig does have his green card, he's a lawful permanent residence, and is domiciled in the same state. Remember, what matters here is, is Craig domiciled in California like Miley Cyrus, <coughs> or does he set domicile up in some other state like Florida or, or, uh, or Kansas? Well, if he's not a lawful permanent resident, or he's not domiciled in the same state, then the alienage jurisdiction is fine. Section 3, I'm going to note extremely briefly, that requires citizens of different states. So you say you have Florida versus California, citizens of different states, U.S. citizens domiciled in those states, suing each other. We have additional defendants. So Florida sues California, my pen's been giving me problems all day. Florida sues California, Germany sues California, 
Florida sues France and Germany sues France. Okay? Well, look at section A3. A suit between citizens of different states and in which foreigners are joined as additional parties. Okay? Well, here we have citizens of different states, namely Florida and California. That's the threshold requirement. Under section A3, as long as you have a citizen of a state versus a citizen of a state, then you can join in additional foreigners, and those foreigners can even be suing each other. That's another exam trap for the wary. I think if these are going to show up on the bar exam, the first one, A1, is something that you guys should know from the first week of law school, right? A2 is, is pretty testable, especially that accept clause, right? I think that's testable. I'd be shocked if this shows up. I, I test on this with my JDs, and they often still get it wrong. I think the bar exam tests everybody on this one, that everybody's going to get it wrong, unless you've been to the review session, and hopefully you'll get, get it right. But how you play with this one is to look at um, a scenario like this. And on my YouTube channel, I actually have a screencast that goes into A1, A2, A3 in great, much greater detail than we did now. Today, we just won't have the time to do that. We're kind of doing a, kind of a scattershot uh, review. So I think that's all I'm going to say about um, diversity. Let's move into federal question jurisdiction. All right. Now, first let's focus on the main federal question uh, statute. District court shall have original jurisdiction of all civil actions involving the Constitution, laws, or treaties um, of the United States. Well, the easy example is when you have somebody suing somebody else under a cause of action, a right of action is created by the U.S. Congress, right? Federal employment discrimination under Title VII or the Age and Discrimination Act, right? Or the ADA or a federal uh, 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 trademark infringement or patent infringement or copyright infringement. That, that's the easy case. We're like, boom, I know it's a federal question. So even it's Florida versus Florida for a dollar for copyright infringement, boom, we're good. It's a federal question. It can be heard in federal court. But the reality of federal question is a little bit more complex than that. So let me get you into, and here this is, by the way, a lot of the material, let me, let me sidebar for a second. A lot of the materials that I'm sharing with you guys today um, is on my website. Now, either in the MBE review section or in the JD review section, I have a huge amount of handouts and problem sets with explanations. You guys know about like Landon style examples and explanations. I have my own problems and explanations on the website handouts and flow charts. So a lot of the stuff you're going to see today is cut and paste it or take it directly from my website. And this is, this is something that I believe is on the website. If you want to analyze federal question, well the first step for, for the good student is to analyze Article 3, which I really doubt is going to be on the bar exam. I don't expect that they're going to go that far. But Article 3 is satisfied for federal, uh, juris, federal question jurisdiction as long as there's a federal ingredient anywhere in the action, whether it's claim, counterclaim, defense, uh, or even just one issue within a claim. It's really easy to satisfy the Constitution. Harder is to satisfy the statute we just looked at, 28 U.S.C. 1331. So the first thing you have to do when analyzing federal question jurisdiction is to do the well-pleaded complaint rule, the WPC rule. That's a rule. It just tells you where to look for a federal question for purposes of the statute. And the place you typically look is in the cause of action in the plaintiff's complaint. You don't look in the defendant's answer. You don't look in the defendant's counterclaim. You don't even consider any federal defenses that the plaintiff includes in his or her complaint, right? That, that's what the facts of Motley itself, right? The plaintiff sued for breach of contract and included in their bill, in their complaint, they included uh, allegations saying that the, a federal defense under, uh, 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 under a, a congressional act would prevent the breach of contract suit. In other words, they anticipated the railroad's defense in their complaint. But the only thing we care about in this well-pleaded filtering step is this. What is the plaintiff's cause of action? What are they, they uh, alleging that entitles them to relief? In other words, like an injunction or money or declaration, right? So a motley was the breach of contract. Once you determine where you can look, you then ask, does that well-pleaded complaint 
contain a federal question. So think of Motley again. The well-pleaded complaint Motley was just a regular old vanilla breach of contract claim, right? Again, a first-year subject. Just regular old state law breach of contract. The analysis, however, is a little bit more complex than that. There's two different ways to answer this question of whether the well-pleaded complaint has a federal question. The first is you look at the Holmes creation test. That's very simple. That's a rule, not a standard. It simply asks, well, who created this cause of action? Was it created by state lawmakers? Or was it created um, under the federal laws, like the Congress and the Constitution or something, right? <coughs> if it's created by federal law or federal lawmakers, then that creation test tells you that it's a federal question for 1331. Well, think of Motley, right? In Motley, a common law breach of contract action is, is a function of state law, created by state common law uh, judges. So the creation test would tell us there is no cause of action here. But under this step, does the well-pleaded complaint contain a federal question? The second step is to do the Grable Gun test, which I will eat my hat if that shows up in the bar exam. Um, the Grable Gun test analyzes when a state law cause of action satisfies 1331. It arises in scenarios when Holmes' test isn't met, but there's a state law cause of action that has an embedded federal ingredient. So say, for example, in the Motley, not the Motley case, the Merrill Dow case, okay, plaintiff sues a drug company for negligence per se. And negligence per se, who creates negligence cause of action? Federal or state lawmakers? State. Yeah, state lawmakers. So the Holmes creation test would say not a federal question. But on the Grable Gun test, they say, hey, we've got this federal, you've got the state law cause of action. What if there's like a federal virus, a federal ingredient in it? So in Merrill Dow, the plaintiff was alleging, hey, negligence per se, and the breach was the failure to abide by a federal labeling standard. Okay? So there was a state law cause of action with some federal law embedded within it, right? And the gun test addresses when that's going to be enough, if that federal ingredient is enough to satisfy federal question jurisdiction. It's a very hard standard to met to meet. I think it's unlikely to be in the bar exam. What I recommend to hear to you is look at the Supreme Court's case of either Grable or Gunn, especially the more recent case of Gunn. The elements are the federal uh, uh, issue in the state law cause of action has to be necessarily raised and actually disputed, easily met. But it's also got to be substantial to the federal system as a whole. Okay? That's a very hard standard to meet. And the fact that there's a standard here under step three and under step four suggests to me that you're probably not going to be tested on the grable gun standard. So I'm going to make a choice here. I'm going to move on because we only have three hours and a heck of a lot of stuff to cover. If you have any questions on grable gun, come and see me, send me an email, come by my office. I'm really happy to talk about it. But I think it would take probably about another 15 minutes to explain this proper, properly, and that's 15 minutes we don't have. Okay? If you end up getting tested on it, let me know. <laughs> then, I'll, then I'll tell the next group. All right. But Dean Singer can tell you the first time I did these reviews for you guys, I think I took four hours and then another three hours on another day, and that's just too much. Overload, right? Do you guys feel overloaded already? Yeah, I thought so. So, uh, there's a couple other things to note very briefly about federal question jurisdiction before we move on. Uh, for example, there are other statutes that supply uh, jurisdiction, original jurisdiction of the federal courts uh, based on federal questions besides 1331. 1331 is coming kind of your federal question catch-all. There's other examples, like Section 1338, which supplies original jurisdiction of the federal courts for copyright and patent uh, claims. Okay? That means they not only can, that means they can be heard in federal court. And what's interesting about 1338, and this is something you could be tested on, patent and copyright claims not only can be brought in federal courts, they must be. So they're not just original to the federal courts, they are exclusively asserted in the federal courts. Which ones? Now, Which ones? Uh, patents, uh, copyrights, Oh, and plant variety oh, okay. protection, yeah. 
Yeah, he says, no state court shall have jurisdiction over any claim. So the first sentence gives the jurisdiction to the federal courts, the original jurisdiction. <coughs> and the second sentence uh, divests jurisdiction from any uh, state court. And the statute was changed in 2010 to make it clear that that means not just claims, but also counterclaims uh, as well. Okay, now I'm going to move on to uh, supplemental jurisdiction, and then we'll do removal. Now look at the statute in a minute. Um, I think the best way of thinking about supplemental jurisdiction is to imagine it's like an ice cream cone um, with sprinkles. And here's what I mean. Think of the cone into which the ice cream goes as the cork, right? If all you have is the cone without the ice cream, then it's really not an ice cream cone, right? It's just a receptacle into which you can put ice cream. Well, if the cone is the cork, then the original jurisdiction is the ice cream, right? And once you have original jurisdiction and this court, in other words, once you have ice cream in a cone, you have a proper lawsuit that can be heard in federal court under subject matter jurisdiction. So for example, if the cone is the federal court, the original jurisdiction of the ice cream could be um, a 1331 federal question. It could be 1338 copyright. It could be 1332 uh, 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 diversity jurisdiction, right? All of those statutes refer to original jurisdiction. Well, supplemental jurisdiction, if original jurisdiction is like uh, ice cream, then supplemental jurisdiction is like the sprinkles that go on the ice cream, right? Because you can have an ice cream cone that's a cone, ice cream, and sprinkles, and that's fine. But if you walk around with a cone that's filled with sprinkles, people are going to be looking at you funny, right? That doesn't make sense. Well, in this analogy, the cone's the court, the original jurisdiction is the uh, ice cream, and the supplemental jurisdiction is on the sprinkles. That tells us something important. Just like an ice cream cone, for, to have sprinkles on an ice cream cone, you first have to have the cone and the ice cream. You can't have supplemental jurisdiction unless you have original jurisdiction. There's no 1367 unless you have original jurisdiction. And that's noted in 1367A. The civil action in which federal courts have, hopefully my pen will cooperate, or not. All right, I'll just point. Original jurisdiction, okay? You must have original jurisdiction. Under Section A, it doesn't matter what that original jurisdiction is, but you must have it under at least one original jurisdiction statute. Diversity, federal question, copyright, what have you. Then you can have the sprinkles, then you can have the supplemental jurisdiction. All right? Now let me carve up the statute very briefly in what each part does. Subsection A is the grant of supplemental jurisdiction. If you have original jurisdiction, you may be able to have supplemental. That grants supplemental jurisdiction. B divests supplemental jurisdiction. In other words, there's some cases where subsection A grants supplemental jurisdiction, but subsection B takes it away, all right? It divests. Subsection C tells the courts circumstances under which they can decline to exercise supplemental jurisdiction, even if they have it. And then what D does is a savings clause. What D does is a savings clause. In other words, if a supplemental claim is dismissed, then it can be refiled in an appropriate state court within the period noted in the statute, and the statute of limitations won't have been deemed to be expired by the mere fact that the uh, uh, claim was in federal court. Okay. Now let's go a little bit more deeply into this. And here I have a handout that you can look at on the website. This carves up the statute bit by bit. You can't see it too well up on the screen, but I'll make it bigger and note the important parts to you. A is that grant. First, is there original jurisdiction? For example, do you have diversity jurisdiction? Do you have a federal question? If so, move on. Are all the claims arising from the same constitutional case? In other words, if you have original jurisdiction over one claim, and you want supplemental jurisdiction over another claim, do they arise from a common set of facts? What Gibbs called the common nucleus of operative fact. Uh, if so, 
then 1367 authorizes supplemental jurisdiction over those additional claims. So say, for instance, let me see if I can get the pen working because I've been having trouble with it all week. Okay, there we go. Let's make P and D citizens of Florida. And P asserts against D a claim for federal employment discrimination. Okay? Seeking nominal damages of one dollar. And say P asserts an additional claim against D for Florida state employment discrimination, also seeking one dollar. Okay, you with me? Now, this claim up here, federal employment discrimination for a dollar, is there original jurisdiction? What kind? Federal question, right? There's no diversity. The amount of controversy is too low, but we have federal question jurisdiction. So here we have OJ under 1331. What about this additional claim? Parties aren't diverse, right? So we don't have diversity. Is this a federal question? No. Yeah, just no way, right? So there's no original jurisdiction here whatsoever. However, let's assume that the state and the federal employment discrimination claims are both asserting the same basic facts, right? Say, firing someone based on their race or their color or their religion, right? And say, and then that's covered on both the state and the federal law. Well, going back to this, <coughs> we have original jurisdiction. It's a common nucleus of operative facts between the original claim and the other claim. Therefore, there's a statutory grant of supplemental jurisdiction over supplemental claim. So the analysis on the 1367A would here would be 1367A is okay. That's your basic analysis. Where it gets a little bit more complicated, and this is where you might be tested, is under 1367B. And my JD students, now we're studying Joinder, and you're about to see a peak of why some of this stuff matters is sometimes A will grant jurisdiction and B will, will take it away, right? So let's go through the analysis of B. When applicable, it will take away supplemental jurisdiction. First, remember, Section B doesn't create, it just takes away supplemental jurisdiction. The second question you have to ask is, what's the basis for supplemental jurisdiction, all right? If the basis for supplemental jurisdiction is not diversity, or not solely diversity, then B is not considered at all. You only have to really analyze subsection B when the only basis for original jurisdiction is diversity. So let's go back to our original example here, right? Federal employment discrimination for a dollar, and then our supplemental claim is state employment discrimination for a dollar. What's the original basis for jurisdiction? Federal question. Is the sole basis for, for original jurisdiction diversity? The well, answer is no. In fact, diversity is not a basis for original jurisdiction at all, which means B doesn't divest jurisdiction at all. Okay? Now, how about this? Suppose you have plaintiff citizen of Florida versus a citizen of Pennsylvania and a citizen of Texas. Count one is for negligence, seeking $100,000. And the count against Texas is negligence, seeking $10,000. OK? Florida versus PA and Texas, negligence for $100,000, negligence for $10,000. Let's assume a multi-car collision, however, the plaintiff suffered different damages from each of the two defendants, okay? Now, is there original jurisdiction over Florida versus PA? Yeah, diversity, right? So, okay, OJ, 1332, we're good. No federal question there, so the only basis, right, the sole basis for original jurisdiction is, uh, is uh, uh, diversity. Now we gotta look at 1367B. 
What's the basis? If it's diversity, then you got to dig further. Then we have to ask whether applying supplemental jurisdiction would be inconsistent with 1332. And the answer here is yes, right? On the one hand, it's the same car wreck, right? And there's original jurisdiction. So section A would grant, 1367A grants jurisdiction, but now we've moved into 1367B, and here's a big question mark. Well, original jurisdiction is diversity, and in what sense would supplemental jurisdiction over Florida versus Texas, in what sense would this be inconsistent with the requirements of 1332? Yeah, the amount of controversy is too low. And we can't aggregate these together because these are claims being sought against different defendants, right? So we got a problem here. Now what the statute tells us to do is to look at three laundry lists. And we have to ask ourselves, please pen cooperate, does the joinder scenario at issue in this fact pattern concern any of these three joinder scenarios? We're going to take them from the bottom on up. Remember, this is Florida versus, what did I say, Pennsylvania and Texas, right? Is this a claim by a person seeking to intervene as a plaintiff under Rule 24? No, because no, the uh, intervener is a party crasher. Somebody who wasn't invited to the party who's trying to join the party. Is it a claim by a person proposed to be joined as a plaintiff under Rule 19? No. It, it, this is a claim by somebody who's already an original plaintiff, right? Is this a claim by a plaintiff against persons made parties under Rule 14, 19, 20, or 24? Claim by a plaintiff against defendants joined under 14, 19, 20, or 24. All right, I'm going to give you a hint. This is a claim by a plaintiff, right? Who's this person? How are they joined? Under 14, 19, 20, 24? What else? What's the joinder rule that permits both of these people to be joined as defendants? 19. Uh, no. <laughs> no. What's that? 24. 24. No. 24. No. Nope. What's that? 20. What'd you say? 20. The one else say 20. The one else are correct. <laughs> Yay, one else. <laughs> yeah, 20. Permissive joinder of multiple plaintiffs or multiple defendants. This is a joinder by the defendant, excuse me, joined by the plaintiff of Florida against two defendants under Rule 20. Now we go back here. Guess what happens? Original jurisdiction was solely diversity, Jack. Allowing supplemental would be inconsistent with diversity because the amount of controversy is too low, Jack. The joinder scenario is this checklist right here is claimed by a plaintiff against persons joined under Rule 20. Check. Guess what? Supplemental jurisdiction is divested. There is none in this uh, scenario. No supplemental jurisdiction. Let's draw a nice big X through it. Now, I'm going to give you a couple quick a variants of this, which you know, might be tested on. Um, one reflects the holding of Exxon uh, versus Alipata. So suppose you have Florida and Florida uh, versus Texas. Negligence for $100,000 and negligence for $10,000. This is okay. First, we have original jurisdiction of Florida versus Texas because the amount of controversy is sufficient. There's original diversity jurisdiction. For the second claim, the second Florida plaintiff versus Texas, the amount of controversy is too low. But assuming that they all arise from the same set of facts, the common nucleus of operative facts, uh, then uh, there'd be a grant of jurisdiction, supplemental jurisdiction under A, 1367A. Here the question is whether or not B takes it away. And in Exxon versus Alipata, the Supreme Court said no. Why? This is a case involving Rule 20 plaintiffs. These are claims by Rule 20 plaintiffs. Do you see that? Remember, Rule 20 
permits joined or multiple plaintiffs or multiple defendants, as long as you have a common uh, transaction or occurrence and at least one common question of fact or law. All right. Let's go back to our laundry list. This first list doesn't say anything about claims by plaintiffs joined under Rule 20. This bars supplemental jurisdiction over claims by plaintiffs against persons joined under Rule 20. And the second one, by persons proposed to be claims by persons proposed to be joined as plaintiffs under Rule 19. What's missing right here? What rule is it mentioned next to Rule 19? What else? Just say what you said before. 20. 20. Rule 20 is not mentioned there. In other words, the joiner scenario we just showed here isn't in any of those laundry lists. What the Supreme Court said is the statute is written does not divest supplemental jurisdiction in this scenario. So the difference between the two is in the first one we did is a claim by a plaintiff against persons joined under Rule 20. The one on the bottom is a claim by Rule 20 plaintiffs against a person. The first one was divested by the supplemental jurisdiction statute the second one was not. All right, there's one last thing that we need to note here. What if we change this person from Florida and we make them Texas? So now it's Florida and Texas versus Texas. The same exact scenario. What's the problem here? There's no complete diversity. The Allapotta case said you can't evade the complete diversity rule by using the supplemental jurisdiction statute. So even though 1367B doesn't prevent jurisdiction here, the problem here is the loss of original jurisdiction, which is required for 1367A. Remember, to have sprinkles, you need ice cream, right? To have supplemental jurisdiction, you need original jurisdiction. The problem in this scenario is not that it's Rule 20 plaintiffs versus a defendant. The problem here is by having Texas against Texas, we destroy original jurisdiction. By having Texas versus Texas, we have no ice cream, we have no original jurisdiction, and without original jurisdiction, we can't have supplemental jurisdiction. So that's a brief review of supplemental jurisdiction. Now let's very briefly go into removal jurisdiction, then I'm going to stop the tape and then we're going to move on to another subject. Now here's removal. A couple things worth noting about removal is, first, under the main removal statute, 1441, the only parties that can do removal are defendants. Plaintiffs don't remove. Uh, second, all defendants who have been properly served have to consent to removal for removal to be appropriate. Okay? Now, normally, removal has to be within 30 days of the last defendant to be served. Okay? normally has to be within 30 days of the last defendant to be served. And the way removal works is you remove from the state court to the corresponding federal court. That's called removal. If we think of it vertically, like state to federal, then be, for example, from Miami-Dade uh, County Court to the Southern District of Florida Federal Court. That's how you remove. You can't remove from the Miami-Dade Court to, say, the uh, Central District of California, off on the other side of the country. You, you can't remove directly into another circuit. You can't do that. Now, if removal is Im Im improper, then what uh, uh, either the plaintiff will do, or sometimes even the defendant, or the court will suggest, remand. And remand is when it goes from the federal court to which it was removed, back down to the state court from which it came. Okay, so you've got removal. Remand. And keep in mind that removal is only done by defendants. Judges don't remove. So say you're in state court and the judge thinks, ah, this would be better in federal court. Uh-uh. It's the defendants who remove, not the judge. Say a case is filed in state court and the federal judge reads about the paper and say, oh, this ought to be in federal court. I'm going to issue an order removing it to my court. No. It doesn't work that way. And equally so. What if a case is originally filed in federal court? 
Say a case is filed between a Florida citizen and a Florida citizen for a dollar for a breach of contract. All right? And it's filed in federal court. And the defendant says, well, this case shouldn't be in federal court. I move for remand to state court. Should the motion be granted? And the answer is no. Because if the action is filed originally in federal court, you can't, remove, you can't remand down to a state court if it was never removed in the first place. Okay? If subject matter jurisdiction is lacking, then the proper remedy here would not be remand. The proper remedy would be dismissal. That's right. Okay. Some of the basics. Now, for removal to be appropriate, there must be a basis for subject matter jurisdiction, which means either original jurisdiction or a combination of original and supplemental jurisdiction. That the original jurisdiction could be diversity, it could be a federal question, what have you, right? There's got to be a basis for original jurisdiction. As noted um, in the statute, blah, 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 in any civil action in a state court where the district courts have original jurisdiction, it can be removed, okay? There's got to be subject matter jurisdiction. But there are some limitations to the scope of removal uh, in certain diversity cases. And that refers, of course, to the forum defendant rule, um, also known as the in-state defendant rule. So say, for example, you have a case where a citizen of Florida sues a citizen of Pennsylvania for negligence seeking $100,000 and files it in common, plea, common pleas court in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. All right, that's a state court where I come from. Court of Common Pleas, should be CPC, should be CCP. Court of Common Pleas in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. All right, well, you think the defendant wants to remove it from the Pennsylvania state court to a Pennsylvania federal court, right? The problem here is going to be the in-state or the forum um, defendant rule under this section here, whoops, okay, we'll just go with this. Um, the language says, otherwise removable solely on the basis of 1332 jurisdiction. In other words, diversity. And any action is removable only on the basis of diversity jurisdiction. It can't be removed if any of the parties properly joined and served as deeds is a citizen of this state where the action is brought. What that means is, if your only basis for removal is diversity, and any of the defendants are a citizen of that state, you can't remove. So say, for example, Florida versus Pennsylvania, and it's filed in state court in Pittsburgh. Can't be removed. Say it's a citizen of Florida versus a citizen of Pennsylvania, 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 and Texas, and the case is filed in state court in Texas. Can't be removed, because at least one of the defendants is a citizen of the state where the action was brought. Okay? The, the reason for this is, if, if any of the defendants are a citizen of that state, then you're not likely to face local prejudice or local bias, right? Because you're a citizen of the forum state, and therefore we don't need a federal forum to avoid bias. So that's one important thing to keep in mind regarding removal. Here's another important thing to keep in mind regarding removal, which it goes to remand. So let me go to the remand statute. So remember how I said that removal normally needs to be within 30 days, right? after the defendant gets notice of the suit, after the serve. Well, remand normally has to be within 30 days after removal. Okay, so there's normally a time limit, limit on remand. So the case is filed in state court, the defendant gets served, the defendant removes it within 30 days. All right? Then, if the plaintiff wants to remand back down to the state court because of some problem with removal, normally the plaintiff has 30 days to seek remand to send it back down. 
All right. Well, the normal deadline is 30 days. Say, for example, there was some sort of procedural defect in removal. Normally, that 30-day statute of limitations. But what if the problem with removal was there was no subject matter jurisdiction at all? Say, for example, citizen of Florida, sues a citizen of Florida in a Florida state court, Miami-Dade County, for a breach of contract seeking a dollar. And the defendant, for God knows what reason, decides to remove the case to the Southern District of Florida. Well, obviously, uh, removal was improper due to a lack of subject matter jurisdiction here, right? No federal question, uh, no uh, diversity. Well, here there's not a 30-day statute of limitations, uh, but rather the district court may, in fact, not may, must remand the case to the state court at any time before final judgment if it determines the subject matter jurisdiction is um, inappropriate, in which case the 30-day limit doesn't, exp doesn't uh, uh, apply. And let me throw just one last thing at you about removal, and then we'll move on to a new topic. Uh, potentially testable is a new statute, 28 U.S.C. 1454. It's about six years old now. And it allows removal by any party, even for a counterclaim. So if there is a case involving patent, or trade, a patent, or a, rather a patent, uh, a copyright law, or plant variety protection, more likely what will come up will be a patent or a copyright law, that can be removed by a plaintiff or a defendant, even if the patent or the copyright claim is raised by way of counterclaim. Isn't that interesting? So that's an exception to the normal rule that uh, uh, only defendants can remove. It's also an exception to the well-pleaded complaint rule. Normally, we only determine federal question jurisdiction by looking at the plaintiff's cause of action, right? But here, removal's appropriate based on even a counterclaim, so long as that counterclaim is a federal copyright or patent. Today, um, generally speaking, it's all federal. Okay, there are a million more things we could say about all this stuff, but that's plenty on subject matter jurisdiction. I'm going to stop the clock. We're going to move on to a new subject.